Uh, we're going to continue in our series now in a very unusual way. Uh, the series is called A Taste of the Good Life. We've been giving you little bite-sized pieces of the good life, different topics of that people would say, okay, that's a good life. For example, we looked at freedom, the good life of freedom, and fruitfulness, having a good name or integrity, having an impact in this world, having joy, success, and last week we looked at meaningful relationships. Everyone would agree that all of these, I think all of these are parts of the good life, but every week of this series, we've also showed you the practices that we all need to engage in if we want to experience those aspects of the good life. So we're going to continue. that. We only have two weeks left in the series, this week and next week. Next week, we're going to look at peace. But this week, we're going to look at that part of the good life that, that I think most of us long for. We don't bring it up very often because it's such a, maybe it's a difficult subject to wrap our arms around, and that is this concept of destiny or calling. How do... How do we know our destiny? How do we know our calling? I think you would agree with me that to know that is to experience the good life. To be frustrated with that is to not experience the good life. So what we're going to do on this weekend is we're going to probe how do you discover your destiny or your calling. Now, destiny is a huge thing. Abraham Maslow in the 1940s and 50s came up with that pyramid, the uh, uh, the hierarchy of needs, he called it. And at the very top of the pyramid, he said, was the number one thing that we all long for, and that's what he called self-actualization. He said it this way, what a person can be, they must be. That's our destiny or our calling or our self-actualization. The Apostle Paul implied this when he wrote to the Philippians. He said, I press on toward the goal for the prize for which Christ has called me, uh, called me heaven, heavenward in Christ Jesus that there is something out there for me to grasp, me to understand why I am here. How do you discover that? How do you do it? Well, you pursue it, you investigate it, you pursue your calling, and we're gonna do this in a very different way. I hope this works. I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm actually gonna do a live interview, uh, a live interview, counseling appointment of a person who wants to know their calling. So in a few moments, I'm going to stop talking to you, and I'm going to pay no attention to you the rest of the time. And instead, I'm going to give all my attention to the man I want you to meet right now. Would you welcome Mike Hosking. Mike, come on up and join me. Hey. How's it going? All right. Good to see you, Mike. Uh, calling. Is it important to you? Uh, it should be, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, talk to me about that. Have you thought about this much? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, kind of about a year and a half ago, I went through a little bit of way, way of discipleship with Brian Raves. And okay. um, kind of was in a transition from teaching high school math to getting out of teaching. And uh, I don't know, I kind of wrestled with what is my calling if I'm mm -hmm. not a teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm not teaching anymore. So. Yeah, what are you doing now? I work at Community Health Network on their kind of health software. Okay. And how many years were you a teacher? Uh, five years. Five years. Okay. So you're in a new role. What, what is this role now? What do you do? Uh, it's a system analyst. It's hard to describe, I guess. Okay. But uh, it's kind of work on the software and tailor it to be specific for what community needs. Okay. Uh, married? Yes. Yeah. Your wife's name? Sarah. How long have you been married? Well, uh, 2010. <laughs> Okay, no, we just, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 2010, you were married, about six years then. Yeah. Okay, you have children? Yes. So Lucy, who's three and a half. Great and name for a child. <laughs> yeah. And Everett, who's a little over one. Everett. Beautiful. Now, all of that, your family's going to come to bear in your calling. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And um, now, I I'll tell you this. We're not going to... We're not going to know your calling at the end of the 30 minutes we're going to be together. But I hopefully will be able to give you a process, what I would call an iterative process. In other words, you can do this again and again and again and again, this year, next year, the year after. And every time you do this, you should have a clear understanding of your calling. Okay? That's, yeah. our, that's our goal. It's a good goal. Uh, yeah, and you know what? I, uh, 
just, you're going to need a piece of paper to, to, to do something in a minute, but before we do that, I want to, I want to clara, clarify some definitions, Mike, okay? Um, some six, six words. If you want to take notes, it's fine. Um, if not, use your mem- as a teacher, you should probably remember a lot of things. Let's start with this. The first word is job. You just told me what your job is right now. A job is basically how we make income to bring home the bacon and work our way through this world. Um, A job is not your calling. I think you know that, right? Now, a job can play into your calling, but but a job is, it'd be too small a thing to say, well, that's my calling. I think you know that. Let me me cover another word, though. Um, Career. How old did you say you are? 29. You're 29. Okay. You might be too young to say you have a career. (laughs) Okay. At one point, you might have been able to say your career was teaching. Teaching. Because a career is like the composite of jobs that you put back to back to back. After a while, if you do one thing for a certain period of time, you can say, well, my, my career is in construction or business or law or teaching or social work. Or, okay. Do you have an idea of the, what your career is yet? No. Maybe you can help me out. Okay. Good. So I think it goes without saying that a... Um, Career is too small a thing to say as you're calling, although we're getting closer. I do want to remind you this. Even though a job and a career is not exactly a calling, we are, according to Paul and Colossians, whatever we do, we, sh- we should do work at it with all our heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Okay? So regardless if it's just a job, we just need to do it with all our heart. Let's go on to uh, the third word. Role. This is the part we play in other people's lives. So help me out. What are some of the roles that you play in this world? Uh, Husband, father. Husband, father. Friend. Friend. You're somebody's son, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Neighbor, uh, co-worker. These are roles. Uh, Roles are huge, but they are not our calling. Now, this can, be, this can be confusing for some people because they put so much stock in the role that they play in this world. Now, don't get me wrong. Roles, and we'll, I'll show you in a minute how roles play a part of our calling, but it's, it's not our calling. So job's not a calling. Career's not a calling. Uh, role's not a calling. I'm going to give you another word. You're a teacher, so you may know what this word is. You know what an avocation is? Let's hear your definition. <laughs> What's that? Let's hear your definition. Yeah, okay. Very smart. Okay. An avocation is a hobby or pastime. It's not the thing that you do. It's not your job. It's the thing you do that gives you joy or leisure. And it, this is, sometimes people confuse this with their calling as well. So let, we'll get to this in a few minutes, but let me, do you have a hobby? Uh, hanging out with kids being outside, playing racquetball. Okay, now hanging out with kids, that's your role, unless it's with not children. Okay, so then just hanging out with friends. Okay, that's also your role. Uh, but so, you're, so playing racquetball. Playing racquetball. Do you like to be active? Yes, mountain okay. biking. Mountain bi- okay, now we're talking mountain biking. These are some of the things that give you joy, the things you invest in your leisure. Now, this one's easier. You know this is not your calling. Right. But if you ever think that maybe your avocation, your hobby, and your, that might play into your calling. The other ones, yes. That one, no. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. We'll see. It may not. It may have nothing to do with your calling. For some people, they have an aha when they go, oh, the thing that I'm really passionate about, well, that could, yeah. And they, didn't, they think, oh, maybe that's just my, the thing I think about on the side. Maybe it should play a part in your calling. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Now, um, people spend, many people spend their whole life with just those four things. You get to be my age, 60 years old, and you think of the jobs you've had, the career, the roles that you've played, and the hobby, and you go, okay, I think I have an idea what my calling is. It's possible to go through most of your life and never think about calling, but my, what I believe is if you never pursue it, there's still a hunger. 
I think you're experiencing that right now. Yeah. You're young, but you're already experiencing, I wish I knew more of why I'm here, okay? Now, that's, that's calling. Um, here's the big difference with a calling. A calling is this. A calling is an invitation. A calling is a beckoning. A calling is a, a summons. And there's only one person in all the universe that can do that to you. Okay? I, no human being can issue a summons. That's what a calling is. And it's from God himself. This is why people hunger. This is why you want to know. Because this is what God has designed you for. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, Ephesians 2.10. How long have you been at Grace, Mike? I don't know. Uh, shortly after this building was... Okay, a long, being, yeah. a long time. So you've probably heard me refer to Ephesians 2.10 maybe a billion times. Okay? For we are God's workmanship or masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is your calling. Before you were born, before you made your debut, God looked at you and he said, he knew your name was going to be Mike. And he said, I like this one a lot. And I've made him a certain way and I have something in store for him or a series of things in store for him, things that I want him to do that will change the world. That's your calling. And you need to know that it's that sacred, that the God of the universe wants you to know what it is. Now, I'm going to introduce one more word that I've actually never said to anybody before. I've, um, this has only been in my thinking. This is like I'm rolling this out for the first time. And I want to add another word to this list, and that's destiny. And I'm going to suggest that it's distinct from call. Um, There's a book you might like by a guy named Bobby Clinton. It's called The Making of a Leader. And what I know about you is you've got leadership, you have leadership chops, so it probably would be good for you to read. Bobby said, um, every human being, male or female, men and women, they come at a point in their life, usually when they're a little bit older, he calls it a point of convergence. When our whole life it all comes together at one place, and this is where I'm going to throw in the word destiny. Now, the bad news is for you, you're not going to know your destiny for some time. When you get to be about my age, your destiny needs to be fairly clear or clearing up because your destiny is, in essence, a series of callings that start to culminate at a place you say, that's... This is what this has all been leading to. But for now, I don't want you to think about destiny. Okay? I want you to think about calling. All right. Does this make sense so far? So would you say it's... Destiny is... A, or calling is a subset of your destiny? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to see... Let me use this illustration and show you that everybody has a series of callings, or I would say it this way. Everybody discovers their calling, and then it gets deeper or broader. Sometimes it changes, and that continues to happen through your life till you get to the point where you're in your probably late 50s, early 60s, where it starts to coalesce into a destiny. Now, let me use this illustration. This is my daughter's uh, quilt, and she made it in 2010, 2010, right after she graduated from IU, and these were all t-shirts of hers. I mean, the whole thing is like all kinds of t-shirts, and in 2010, well, for example, this, she was in a lot of theater. This was from a theater thing she was in. This, she was in West Side Story at her school. She was a Delta, a Delta Gamma at, at IU. Here's another Delta Gamma thing in the Greek. She was all about the Greek system when she was in IU and Greek InterVarsity and, and the whole thing. In 2010, if we'd have looked at this, and that was now six years ago, we'd have, we would have said, this is who Lucy is. That's why I like name, Lucy. Um, this, is, this is who Lucy is. This, we might even be able to have a sense of her calling. We'd step back and go, oh, you know what? She should probably be doing something in theater. Maybe she should involve in music. We would have missed what happened next. We would have been able to discover her calling in 2010, 
But what happened over the last six years is she graduated from IU, she moved to Cincinnati, she worked for General Mills, she got married, then she went on to Northwestern where she's finishing up her MBA right now and she's gonna start working for Tyson Foods. So who she is now, if she added the marriage section and she added the General Mills and Cincinnati and she added, we'd have a much better picture of who she is now. She's your age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's gonna be 29. She is, six years ago, looked completely different. And this is the same is true for you. You have a quilt. We're gonna, this, let's, uh, this, so you can make a little graph on your piece of paper there that looks something like this. You have patches on your quilt. We're gonna call this your calling quilt. They're gonna describe who you are at this moment in time. So let's add a couple of things we already know. Uh, you're married for, uh, how many years did you say? 2010, did you say? Yes. So six, six. years. So um, six years married. Two kids. Yep. Your job right now is a systems analyst, did you say? Yeah. Are you going in a particular order, or are you just no? Filling? We're just we're gonna we're gonna do the composite of who you are. So, how many years were you teaching? Five. Okay, five years teaching. Let me stop right there. Did you like that teaching? teaching? Yeah, I love teaching. Why did you leave it? That's a whole conversation there. Well, that's kind of why we're <laughs> here, right? <laughs> no, uh, so I guess I'll. There's a lot of bureaucracy behind teaching and financial aspects and I'll say the biggest reward that I talk about with my wife of not teaching is I come home and now I have energy for my family and so like that's just a huge reward of not teaching okay because we invested so much so the 90 minutes of a class I absolutely loved okay. a lot of the other stuff maybe not as much okay and when you came home you were wiped out because then you also had to work think on teaching plans and all that stuff and mm -hmm. individually dealing what age did you teach high school math okay well then you had all the students to deal with but there were certain aspects of that that you really enjoyed yeah pay attention to that okay because there I'm not suggesting that you should go back into teaching don't don't get me wrong but there's something about this five years that you need to continue to process do you like your job right now? Yeah, I do, actually. What do you like about it? Um, it's unique. It has a series of challenges that I can kind of use logic and work through. And okay. um, as far as the teaching goes, I, I kind of tell people 30% of the job is not my job requirement. I kind of do whatever I want okay. because... You mean this, I, this job In that here. job. And I pull in and I... Like, I'll teach a lesson on a new application that we got, and so I bring in the teaching aspects, and okay. um, I just love kind of working and helping people. Um, are you a problem solver? Yeah. Okay. At your core, you are, right? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, education, I didn't ask you this. Where, where'd you go to school? I actually started out at Purdue for engineering and uh, actually started skipping classes to tutor friends. And so then I realized, oh, maybe I should go into teaching. Okay. Um, <laughs> skipped <laughs> classes. But this is important. Um, Am I skipping classes? Oh, yeah. Because you have to ask yourself, why did you do that? What was it about tutoring that, tutoring friends that... Uh, I mean, I can, I can do the classes, but they needed help. So it was like kind of an easy, yeah, sure, I'll do it. It gave you life? Yeah. Okay. Kinda Again, you skip classes because to, how do you spell tutor? To tutor, to tutor friends. This was huge. That's huge. Now then, we're, go then ahead. Then Ball State. I'm sorry? Then Ball State. Ball State. Um, Let's, let's go down this road of the way you're wired because you, I think you've, you've touched on it a little bit. To prepare for this, I ask you to, to take the Enneagram. Have you ever taken that before? No, I have not. Okay. I've, you've probably taken other personality tests, right? I have two. This one is probably the best 
test I've ever taken. It's the most revealing. Was it revealing to you? I would say yes, and when I talked to Sarah, she was like, that is absolutely you. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you this. You, um, your test score is the same as my wife's, so I get you, okay? Uh, and she said the same thing. She said, well, that's kind of me, and I said, no, that is you. So let's talk about, here's what it says you are. Are you ready for this? Um, you value being a good person more than anything else. For those, uh, Enneagram, I don't know how much you read on this, there's, um, there's nine numbers, describe nine different personalities. You're a one, okay? Um, you usually work very hard to live up to your potential and to listen to this, help others do the same. Hmm. You can engage the world in a serene manner, that's clear, uh, accepting the way you and others are. This is important. It's important to you that others be allowed to be who they are, right? You're not trying to force people into being something. Um, you work hard to improve things and make the world a better place. You realize the process of wholeness takes time and you trust that you and the world are going in the right direction. It's really important to you to be going in the right direction, isn't it? Um, you have the natural ability to find the right way to do things. I think so, at least. Yeah, okay. Because this, and you stick to it. Yeah. And you want other people to know that too. My wife would sometimes disagree. Yeah. Are you insufferable, pretty much? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> You're idealistic, right? Very much so. You're conscientious? Most of the time. You're a hard worker? You want to do things well. You can be exact and precise? Very mm -hmm. much. And you're a good quality control person, okay? You find it easy to follow rules and procedures? You know, say, so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, this describes you pretty well, doesn't it? All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Just because you understand, I'm going to just put this, it's, you're a one. Now, this is painfully undeveloped. There's so much more you can read through this. And I have more material for you, and I'm going to go out and limb and suggest that um, we have a couple of staff members here that are pretty conversant in this test, David Bell for one, and Ennis Jarvis, and I'm gonna go ahead and recommend one of them to you for you to sit down and let them unpack this whole test. Um, now, here's why we're doing it. I'm, I'm having you look at this not because you go, okay, I know who I am. It's because when you start putting this together, how you're wired, your experience, some of the things that you've had at where you are right now, then you start to go, oh, I'm looking at my quilt. I'm looking at the quilt of my calling, and it starts to make a little more sense and maybe even give you some direction about where you should be headed. All right, let's, I ask you to also take a um, spiritual gifts test, yes. right? What did you discover? Spiritual gifts, of course, are what the, how the Holy Spirit has made you. Special gifting he's given you. I could almost guess what they're going to be, but let's, let's what, what did you discover? What are your spiritual gifts? So my top three were faith, administration, and leadership. Now, you understand that when you exercise this is the way this works. When you exercise leadership and faith and administration, that's when you feel the wind of the Spirit because that's the way he's designed you. So let's start putting this together. Exercising leadership, administration, and faith as a one with your passion for teaching but without all the drama attached to it, the desire to help people know what direction to move in. You see... When you start putting this all together, man, you are working in your sweet spot. Let's go one step further. Um, let's talk a little bit about your experience growing up. Um, parents still alive? Yes. Okay, and married? Yeah. Okay, their whole lives? Yes. Okay, so they've been married a lot of years. Um, have a good relationship with your parents? 
It's a yes. Okay. Um, one of your parents a little more demanding than the other? Uh, I don't, don't really think either of them are demanding. They're not demanding. Okay, so there's the reason why I'm asking, did you ever feel like you had to live up to a level of expectation that you didn't quite meet? I'll say yes, but probably because of what I put on and not what they had. Talk to me about that. Oh, I don't know. That's... Um, I don't know, I've always wanted to strive, and it might be because of siblings and what they've accomplished, the youngest of three. Oh, okay. So. Okay, hold on there. <laughs> what do your other two siblings do right now? So my brother is a civil engineer, and uh, my sister uh, stays at home. She was a chemist. She has a couple kids now. Okay, so they're highly educated and highly successful in what... Okay, and, and has that been your whole life? Pretty much. Living under their shadow? Did you have a hard time keeping up with them? Yeah, I'd say yes. Okay. And then brother, physical, 6'4", so kind of okay, sport-wise so, too. And he was all about the sports, and he was very successful. So it's the brother that, that pretty much is the shadow. You love him. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but... Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Do you see why this is important? Yeah. Okay, because if you're the youngest of three and you're in the shadow of a, an, an older brother, he's older brother, right? Mm -hmm. How much older? Three years. Okay. That starts to play into how you function in this world. Actually, to be really, really honest with you... Um, well, you're being honest, let me be honest with you. Uh, for years, I, I love my dad. My dad passed away about three years ago. Um, my dad was always proud of me. So I didn't, live, I didn't have an older brother or sister. Um, I kind of wish my dad would have been a little more affirming of me. As a matter of fact, there were times when I'd come home from school and I would be working on, I said, Dad, I, I really don't understand how to do this. And he would go, he'd roll his eyes because my dad was an engineer. He was brilliant, self-made man. And so I lived for years with the expectation that I had to prove to him and to everybody else that I was worth it, worth it. And I'll be honest with you, my first couple of years preaching at Grace, there were times I got up to preach, and I mean, I was trying to make God proud of me, but at the same time, I was trying to make hundreds of people proud of me. So I'm being honest with you. These kind of things shape us. So then I'd say, uh, so like my dad, I feel like growing up, I don't know, he was great as a kind of younger kid, kind of loved, but then... 13-ish, mm -hmm. not as much there. As far as a role model, if mom was sick, we didn't go to church. You know, if we went to church, we played games if we sat by him on the pew kind of a thing. And um, I've always wanted him to do more. Mm -hmm. So I think when I was looking at the Enneagram thing, one of the things my wife, we talked about was the, uh, I should have made better notes, but I like to do, if if uh, like I'm feeling guilty about this, I will do the opposite to pursue it, to make up for it. And I feel like I see many times what I don't like in my dad, and so that's what I pursue even mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's just a reality. That's just an experience. I wouldn't even know... I, won't even, I wouldn't even know how to articulate that you would. But it's a shaping thing. You could go back and look at how does it shape what you do now? How did it shape your teaching? It's important because as you go forward, all of our experiences can be redeemed. But sometimes there'll be scars for the rest of our life. And it's going to be, I know for the rest of my life, I'm, I'm going to struggle with making sure I never feel ashamed. 
you're probably have, you have your own struggle because of your past. And just be aware that when you start thinking about your calling, that's like a shadow that hangs over it. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let's take, let's take a little different tack. Six broken places, all right? Uh, we talk about it as a church, uh, separation from God, isolation from one another, the decay of the planet itself, uh, injustice, hatred, uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, uh, isolation, pain, yeah, okay, I think I got them all. Now, what I ask you to do was take a look at them and see if any of them jump out at you and you say, that makes my blood boil, or that's the one that bothers me the most. Which one would it be? Injustice. Okay. Just saying something that's not fair. Well, well that makes sense, because things have to be fair and right. Correct. Okay. Is there anything, any specific injustice that bothers you? So I, I put for me, so it's not necessarily the poverty, hungry, big things coming from education. It was the disparity of education and family lives that students have coming in and kind of the success is, hinges a lot upon yeah. that. Which always bothered you, right? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was deeply troubling. And if it, if, if it wasn't for all the bureaucracy and the financial aspects, you would still be giving yourself to that. Because you want, you want every child to have the kind of family that they can thrive in, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so the injustice of uh, education, inequity. Have you, Mike, have you done anything with any ministries to get involved in that? Not in particular. Uh, for a little bit when I was at Carmel, I started a kind of free tutoring program that I kind of worked with some of the counselors to identify some students in need and kind of helped. And then I had a student teacher the next year and that eclipsed with time. Mm -hmm. But so I kind of pursued that. It's always been on the back of my uh, had, when I left teaching, I have an open invite from the principal that I can come and do free tutoring at the school. Which school? Carmel High School. You have an open invite from the principal. Why did the principal say that to you? Because I asked him. <laughs> when I was I, I, it's just one of the things I said, you know, I, I'm still very passionate about it, and so if I know I'm not teaching there and you know, would it be possible to utilize that building as a future kind of resource? And he said, yeah. And he said, if you go figure out and you have room in, after your job, come back. Still trying to figure out if I have room and timing, travel, school ends well before teaching or job ends, so mm -hmm. transition. But that's just kind of been in the back of my mind. Is that, like, does it sometimes leap to the front of your mind? So I... So I'm on my job right now, and I'm actually waiting on a potential job offer, maybe, that I was hoping to find out Friday, might be Monday, don't know, and in my head, I've actually, kind of going through this again, started wondering if I could negotiate schedule into that. Okay, when you start doing those kind of things, now you're, start, you're putting probes out about calling. Because I have a sense, looking at this here, that there's this, look, I don't, think, I don't think there's a job you couldn't do well, right? Your quality control, if you could put your mind to it, first of all, you're intelligent. You want to do, do, do things right. I don't care what job it is, you're going to do a good job. But I have this sense that even a job well done is not going to scratch the itch. Because there's something that comes out of this, plays with this, and with the tutoring, and with the teaching. I don't know what it is. But you need to keep sending the probes out. Because somewhere in there is your calling. Now, I'm going to wrap it up here. We don't know what this is, nor this nor this. They're coming down the road. Your life on Monday may change, and you're going to add another piece of your quilt. A year from now, something else may change. Every time you add another big piece of your quilt, or probably on an annual basis, you need to pull this out, look at it again, sit down with your wife, and say, okay, 
Now I'm 30. What's my calling? Now I'm 31. What's my calling? I'm th- you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you keep doing that year after year after year, and you walk into what God wants you to do. And when you get to be my age and you add up all that, then I'll start to feel like a destiny. I feel like I actually need to keep that and like have a nice piece of paper. You can take a picture of it if you want. My phone's off, but I'll do that <laughs> okay. in a moment. Was this, is this helpful for you? Yeah, I think so. Just, I mean, it was helpful even knowing that I was going to do this and taking the Enneagram and the, the, the spiritual gifts to kind of just have, I don't want to say forced, but like yeah. say, investigate this, think about it. And then that coupled with this just kind of makes me further question. I don't think I have an answer, but it's helpful, Good. definitely. Good. And by the way, thanks for being willing to do this in front of a lot of people. Would you thank Mike for doing this? Thanks.